Okay, fall is in full effect. And um, what do you do during the fall time frame for your plants, including your bonsai, your figs, and everything else like that? Um, in this video, I want to talk a little bit about the maintenance needed to do fall work and some of the, um, maybe facts and fiction when it comes to fall uh, and plants. So um, let's dive right into it. Okay, so I'm under my uh, Shiro plum tree and take a look at this. These are all leaves that have fallen off of the tree and um, they're falling to the ground. Now we can rake them, throw them away, compost them, uh, or leave them here. And guess what happens? This is a tree's natural ability to fertilize itself in the wild. So deciduous trees will drop leaves. It's a um, evolution that they've developed over millions of years to be able to feed themselves, drop leaves that um, or disease, damage, or no longer functional, um, and then go into dormancy. So during this dormancy, what happens with these leaves is they'll eventually decompose and then turn into nutrients that uh, the tree can use for the following year. So it is somewhat of a falsity that you don't use any nitrogen to fertilize your trees during the winter time because these leaves will break down after about four to six to eight weeks uh, and then turn into something usable and leaves have carbon have nitrogen and the tree will be able to use that to uh, develop for the next year it's not going to react by growing new shoots just because there's nitrogen in the fertilizer it's not going to grow new shoots the new shoots is triggered uh, by a chemical response daylight day length heat things like that um, and so if you fertilize in the winter time and you do have nitrogen don't freak out the tree is only going to use what it needs um, so high potassium high phosphate is great don't worry if you have a little bit of nitrogen that you're feeding the tree because look what happens here that's natural nitrogen so by all means I do not want to tell you that you know you should fertilize your bonsai plants with fallen leaves definitely don't do that but um, as far as you know your in-ground plants and whatnot those leaves will basically become the new food or nitrogen you know for the tree for the following year I hope that after watching this video you will never throw away another banana peel again if you have a garden save those banana peels and Feed them to your in-ground trees. Bananas break down relatively quickly and they have a wide range of nutrients very beneficial for plants, especially potassium, which enhances the growth and fruit production. Okay, so should you pull off the leaves before they fall off naturally on certain trees? No, absolutely not. The longer the leaves stay on the tree during the fall time frame, the longer it's photosynthesizing and then building up the energy uh, needed for the tree to go into dormancy uh, for the winter time. So when you pull off the leaves on a tree uh, too early, what happens is you weaken that tree. We all know that trees use photosynthesis to generate energy. This all happens within the leaves. What makes those leaves green is chlorophyll. That's why if there is a magnesium deficiency, the veins on the leaves stay green, but the leaf tissue actually turns yellow. So keep that in mind. Magnesium deficiency equals a tree's inability to photosynthesize. And if they can't photosynthesize, they cannot feed itself. In the fall, when trees begin their process of dormancy, trees are actually very efficient machines. They will reabsorb all of that chlorophyll and energy, the sugar and starches, away from the leaves and back into the vascular tissue to prepare itself for winter. So when you see the leaves change colors, 
Think about it this way. It's shutting down the food factory and reabsorbing all of that energy from the leaves, including the chlorophyll, back into its vascular tissue. This is triggered by the amount of daylight as well as the temperature. In essence, if you pull the leaves off prior to the fall, before the Take leaves turn tree. color, you're robbing that tree of its natural resources to prepare itself for winter dormancy. Leave the leaves, leave the leaves on the tree for as long as possible. Don't put, pick them off, let it happen naturally. Here's a question that I had when I first started working with maples and um, bones eyes is when do you make the big cuts on your Japanese maples uh, or pretty much most deciduous material for bones eye? Once the tree is doing this, it's telling these leaves and these branches that hey, I don't need you anymore. I'm going to actually suck back the energy that I've given to you and then. Um, but you fall off. Let's say you wanted and waited to uh, until this time frame to do some major work. This would be the perfect time. And the second time you can do that is um, towards kind of the May, beginning of June time frame after the tree. Uh, so springtime, late spring basically, after the tree has used all of its stored up energy from the winter and then flushed out the new growth. You can also do major cuts then because once that flush of new growth, new leaves, new branching uh, has developed in the spring, the amount of uh, water, sugars, and starches moving to these outer branches uh, lowers a bit uh, or isn't pumping at full force. So you can do major cuts then because then the tree won't bleed as much. And before you do any of that, you got to make sure the tree is healthy. That, that's the number one rule. Don't make any major cuts on a sick tree or a tree that you know is not doing too well or has fungus or anything like that. So just, you know, make sure the tree is healthy first. It's a chilly day, so um, I've got my hood up. And uh, I actually want to show you something interesting. So when it comes to maples um, and any kind of deciduous that changes colors in the fall, sun is kind of one of the key factors to making it um, kind of develop more of that fall color. So check this out. This is my uh, sh Shinde Shoujo. Um, and it's interesting because it, it's held a lot of its green. It's known for its red color, but it's held, held a lot of its green because it's completely blocked out by that Sangu Kaku behind it. As far as the sun goes and um, you can kind of see it sparkling back there and then these big uh, cypresses that are right behind it and this is why I keep most of my maples right here because um, it gets the most shade and uh, during the summertime some of these maples can get pretty burnt so um, you can see the difference uh, with the trees that get more sun exposure throughout the year compared to the ones that don't. So the Shinda Shoujo right here, a lot more green than um, than the others. My Sharps Pygmy uh, was in a good amount of sun. Um, I kind of move it around depending on how hot it is. So it's a lot more yellow and orange. These Sengukaku coral barks, you know, they get, uh, they're large enough to kind of pick up the sun. So they, they get their color. These are some uh, D shoujos, not the shin type, but D shoujos, so the original shoujos. They've been uh, exposed to the sun and um, they've picked up a little bit more pink. This is my uh, autumn full moon, you can see here. This has been in full sun before it got to uh, to me. And so you can see the leaves here and they are ready to wither away, but they've got this beautiful yellow color. And then right here, you got a Ukigomo, another Shinde Shoujo, and then the Shishigashara here is completely yellow and orange. Usually it's very green. 
And then this right here is my uh, Nishikigawa. It's a rough bark type of maple. Now, if you look at it, the top part is a lot more reddish than the bottom part. And that's because that bottom part gets no sun. This top part does get sun. So let's take a look at this uh, Nishikigawa uh, cork bark Japanese maple. Uh, you can see the delineation of kind of where the tree is more red and then you know as you work your way down to the bottom where there's less light the tree kind of goes through this rainbow of colors from reddest to greenest well the tip is where it gets the most sun and then down below is where it gets the least amount of sun so sunlight uh, and UV rays do affect the color of the leaves and how quickly they change Okay, so I have an air layer on this uh, Shishikashara, Japanese maple, uh, but I feel like the roots haven't developed enough to uh, be separated. Uh, you can actually leave air layers on throughout the winter and have a high rate of survival. Uh, I'm doing a calculated move here. I think if I remove it, I will have a lower rate of survival because of you know, the, that air layer will be on its own without any additional uh, help from the mother plant. So all I'm going to do here is I'm going to start aerating the plastic. Try not to poke into um, the roots. But I'm going to make it so that this thing does not fill up with water through the winter. And then, um, you know, let that breathe, not become anaerobic, and uh, I'll separate it in the spring. Okay, so one of the other kind of winter preparation things we do in the fall is um, I have the benefit of a greenhouse. I'm going to put some of the smaller pots and um, trees that I freshly threw into a bonsai pot into the greenhouse for some additional winter protection. I mean, the, the roots are really the heart of the plant. And uh, if it's in a tiny little bonsai container, more than likely it could freeze to death and die. So obviously I've got some of the, uh, I actually have my uh, Korean horn beam. I, I changed pots because the, the pot that it was in was clogged and it wasn't draining very well and so I uh, you know changed the pot on this guy it's reacting to a little bit of that uh, pot change because I had to cut off some of the roots and um, it dropped off all of its leaves already sooner than the other Korean hornbeams that I've got um, so I'm throwing this one into the greenhouse so it has time to recoup has a little bit a couple more weeks to kind of develop some roots and uh, you know, move some of that sugar and starch into the areas where it needs it. Obviously, this little tiny barberry has a tiny little pot, so yeah, and this plastic cup needs to protect it. I'm just kidding. Um, little azalea and my other azalea here. Um, so these guys have been freshly potted, and that's why they're in here as well. That's a blueberry, and that's just an acer rubrum. There's something else that you can do to um, protect your trees a little bit more, you know, you're in a kind of a colder zone. Here in Seattle, it's a little bit more temperate, so we don't get too cold. We hardly ever dip past 20, and if we do, it's maybe for a day or, or half of a day. But if you're in a colder climate than we are, and you have your uh, bonsai on benches like this, just remember that when you go over bridges and overpasses that part of the freeway will typically freeze over because it's suspended it's got airflow underneath it's got airflow over the top and it's colder so if you take your trees you know some of you are kind of 
maybe deciduous material or smaller pots. If you have the benefit of the greenhouse, perfect. If you don't, put them on the ground and um, you might get up to anywhere from 70 degrees of uh, warmer temperatures because of the ground for that winter protection. Okay. Okay, so I've taken all of my deciduous trees off the benches because you know, they're the ones that tend to be a little bit more less uh, uh, tolerant to extreme cold. This is a burning bush. It'll do just fine here, but because it's in a, a shallow bonsai pot, I don't want the roots to die off, so I'm just taking some precaution. I've also nestled some leaves around it because if you guys have ever had or created a compost pile, decaying leaves generate heat. Don't top the plant because what happens if you top the plant is that um, cause water not to be able to drain through that soil. The leaves can decay and then kind of clog up that soil um, or you invite pests or mold or fungus and um, you know it could hurt the plant. So keep it around it but not on top of it. There's also something to keep in mind when your trees uh, prepare to go dormant for the winter in the, in the fall is that trees need 40-40, okay? They need 40 days under or between 32 and 40 degrees to go dormant properly. So if they go below 32 degrees, those days don't count as full dormancy. Uh, if they go above 40 degrees, those days don't count as full dormancy. So there's three types of dormancy and we'll talk about those. You know, it's something nice to know. You, not necessarily you have to know, but three types of dormancy when it comes to plants. So let's list them out here. All right, here you can see the, most of the leaves have already been blown off. Uh, the deciduous trees that I have in my garden and um, Trees have adapted so well to you know, the, the changing of the seasons, right? Have you noticed that every time there's a changing of the season, the wind blows much, much harder between kind of like the transition from you know, summer to fall and then fall to winter. And there's always really strong winds and either knockout power. Well, trees have adapted to this. So, you know, when they change the colors of the leaves, turn into those fall colors, the wind um, we'll blow those leaves off. It's an amazing adaptation. Trees have developed a dormancy per period in the wintertime to survive the cold and freezing temperatures. Dormancy is like hibernation in that everything within the plant slows down, its metabolism, its energy consumption, growth, and more. The tree's metabolism also slows down during dormancy, and this is part of why cell growth is impeded, since it has to conserve the food it has stored it's best if the tree uses it up slowly and only for essential functions. It's natural for trees to go through dormancy cycles and the lifespan of the plant is dramatically decreased if the tree isn't allowed to go dormant for a few months. Trees have winter dormancy for a reason and it's best just to let them run their course. Okay, so I've left all of the conifers uh, pines, junipers, um, what else? Cedars on the benches. You can see here it's all green, all the evergreen conifers. And uh, they do just fine uh, with kind of the cold fluctuation and go. So they, I've left them on the benches to kind of gather more light because pines actually still uh, photosynthesize through the winter. So uh, I'm giving these guys more opportunity to create sugars and starches and generate uh, energy and photosynthesize throughout the winter. I've moved all the deciduous material down to the ground close to the fence because it does um, generate more heat down there or the temperatures don't fluctuate as much as being on a bench. So. Um, yeah, might be a good idea. You know, like I said, Seattle's a little bit more temperate 
and we don't worry about harsh winters as much as some of the uh, colder zones. We're in 8B. Um, so it might be a good idea to move your bonsai trees. If you're just starting out, you know, you don't know what to expect for the winter on the ground. Um, Okay, so let's talk about one more thing here. Um, and what are the root kill temperatures on certain varieties? Um, I read an article in the Oregon State University's horticultural program that kind of listed out the uh, different temperatures that will kill the roots um, in certain varieties. And I'll list it in the next screen over because there's a lot to list, but I'm gonna filter it for you guys uh, on mainly the plants that we work with in bonsai. Okay, so what is root kill? Root kill is basically the temperature um, at which a particular plant variety will die um, you know, when it comes to chill, frost, and coldness, basically. Um, and so typically we wanna be able to recognize and protect the particular variety of plants that we keep um, at least three to five temperatures above that uh, root kill temperature so that, um, you know, obviously it doesn't die on us. Okay, so finally, what do you do in the fall with uh, maybe pruning or working on some of your trees? So I'm going to go through uh, a quick list here of everything that you should, you know, think about when fall comes around on your bonsai trees. So let's uh, let's start. You also want to fertilize your trees um, with, you know, high potassium, high phosphate, low nitrogen, if any, uh, in the fall. I keep a tub here of uh, bone meal and slow release together and um, I use this and I sprinkle it pretty much on my trees all year long but it also works for the fall. So this will eventually break down over the next few weeks, months um, as the tree is going through dormancy. Fall is also a good time to do trimming on your Japanese maple to get rid of all the long coarse growth um, that has been growing throughout the, the summer and spring season. So um, let's take a look at this. This is my Arakawa and um, zoom in on some of the coarse growth. Okay, so this, this tree hasn't exactly dropped off all of its leaves, but that's okay. So let's take a look at this particular branch right here. These inner nodes are a lot longer than I would like, um, but I'm just going to cut it back to that first one and then let it develop from there. Okay, let's take a look at another one. All right, let's remove this leaf. So once the leaves have changed colors, it's safe to remove them. Um, the tree's already reabsorbed that chlorophyll back into its system, and um, the leaves are going to fall off naturally, anyways. So let's take a look at this branch right here. <clears throat> There's two nice short nodes here, and one super long node. I'm just going to cut the middle one. So, if you do this throughout the tree in the fall, perfect time to do it. Don't forget to trim your larches. This is a larch that I have in ground. Um, you know, it's, I'm basically just trying to thicken up the trunk. 
you know, get rid of all the coarse growth and with larches, prune back to where there's a bud and you're pretty safe that it will come back next year without any issues. Go back to um, two buds per branch and you know anything long and coarse like that you can kind of take off as well. You know, if you can create a pyramidal shape, that's fantastic. Let's take a look at this tree from uh, below. So, okay, here's a dogwood. It's already lost all of its leaves and you know, it's got really long, coarse growth. It's a young tree, so I'm just kind of letting it grow. But um, now would be a good time to create ramification by cutting back this coarse growth and um, uh, so that way when spring comes out that it'll you know grow from where you made the cut and hopefully it will ramify and divide so let's cut this tree fairly young tree so I am not too worried that um, I'm cutting off too much um, it's a tree in development okay so I've hacked off all of the long growth on here and um, I'll let this thing flush back next spring. This is Japanese white pine. These are the colors that it develops towards fall. This is pretty natural. The tree's not dying. It's just basically dropping some of the older needles. And typically those older needles are found farther back in the branch. You just kind of shake them off. Pretty normal process. Pretty easy to clean off. Just shake them off. So in the fall, you want to do some bud selection um, on your on your pines, especially if you have um, you know Japanese black pines that have been decandled, de and you have you know huge flush of buds that come out of one node. So like in this instance, you know, you, you want to pick um, two out of you know the bunch this one has a bunch i'm gonna leave it and let it grow um so basically bud selection like in this instance right here there's four i'll probably keep these two and cut those other ones bend the tree that way so it gets more of that kind of arching arching look about it I'm gonna go about almost halfway through. I'm doing this towards the end of October because the sap flow. We're gonna try to bend it. That is it right there. And look at that bend. Isn't that beautiful? Now that straight trunk has this very smooth curve. Um, Okay guys, so I hope you found that informative and you know somewhat useful uh, to kind of you know learn a little bit more about what's happening with your plants and bonsais when it goes from uh, summer to fall and then in a winter um, and what to expect with them and maybe how to kind of protect them um, you know if you have a plant that is outside of its usual climate zone you know it's a good idea to maybe protect it especially if you have tropicals so. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, my name is Ben. I'll see you on the next video. Um, let's go check on Nolan to see what he's doing over there.
Hey Nolan. Hey Nolan, what you doing? Oh, is it is it your bonsai? Okay, let me see what you're doing, okay? Wow. That tree looks amazing. Look at how old and aged it looks, Nolan. <laughs> Nolan, is that your first bonsai? Wow, it looks like it is. It is awesome. But this is your tree, okay? Don't just cut every tree. Let me see. Wow. Okay. You think it's you think it's had enough? Okay. Let's let's see if it'll come back.